Well, now to our guest, Dinah Butu is a Palestinian lawyer based in the West Bank. She's a former advisor to President Mahmoud Abbas and to the Palestinian negotiating team. She joined us just a short time ago from the town of Ramallah. Dinah Butu, thanks for being there. Thank you. Uh, so after the fierce attacks on Syrian demonstrators, President Barack Obama has now directly targeted senior figures in the regime, starting at the top with President Assad. But does it really matter? what the U.S. does to or with Syria? Will it stop anything? Well, I think it's important to keep in mind that the U.S. does not have a very good track record when it comes to the Middle East because of the double standard that it's imposed uh, throughout various countries in the Middle East. For example, with regard to Israel, it has never imposed sanctions on Israel, and yet it's doing the same in Syria. That said, I think that it's important that, uh, that these types of messages be sent to leaders to say that they cannot continue to violate the human rights of their citizens, and in the case of Israel, the people that, uh, that they continue to rule over. So I think that this this is an important message. I'm not so sure it was going to translate in, in, into anything on, in, the immediate, uh, in the immediate term, but I think in the long term it may. Let me ask you this, and uh, leave Israel aside just for a moment, but how is the Syrian regime and its treatment of these demonstrators, how is that viewed in the Arab world, and particularly in Palestine? Well, I think it's important to put it in its context, which is that uh, for many, many, many years, the only thing that these Arab regimes were focused on was that they were focused on things that were external to them, which is why these governments were uh, ma maintained in power for so many years. This is why, for example, that, uh, the, that the U.S. was actually supporting, such as the Mubarak regime or the, the regime in Tunisia. Um, and so the way that they're now being viewed is that people are legitimately demanding freedom, and they want to, to get their freedom from uh, these regimes. And they're actually saying, look, it's not enough that you focus on the external. It's now time to also focus on the internal. And in particular, I think it, we cannot leave Israel out of the discussion. In the case of Egypt, what people were saying is that that Egypt's freedom cannot, uh, cannot be held hostage to stability for Israel. In other words, if Israel wants to have a stable Middle East, then they have to deal with the question of Palestine. And this is something that demonstrators all throughout the Middle East are now saying, is that they need to start dealing with the region as a whole and deal with the human rights comprehensively. It is very complex, and of course Israel is not being left out of the equation when it comes to Syria, because uh, there are tens of thousands of Palestinian refugees living in Syria. And last weekend, during the day of Nakba, thousands of them stormed the fence on the Syrian-Israeli border in the Golan Heights. And, of course, immediately there came accusations that that protest had been orchestrated by the Syrian regime as a kind of warning to Israel and to the United States. I think that that's giving a little bit too much credit to the Assad regime, and I think it's giving too little uh, weight to the fact that Palestinian refugees have been demanding for 63 years that they get their right to return. Um, you know, interestingly, when Netanyahu came out immediately after that speech, he said that, that these Palestinians were invading Israeli territory, and he seemed to have forgotten the, iron, the irony that actually it's Israel that's occupying Syrian territory. So I think that... Uh, it gives too much credit to the, to the Assad regime to say that these were people that were sent over. But I, and I think it really undermines the, the deep-seated feeling on the part of Palestinians worldwide that they do want to have the right to return to their homes. And the only reason they haven't been able to do so is because they're not Jewish. But, but so they, I think I, that it's I, important I, to keep this in mind when we talk about these actions and Israel's response. It's mm -hmm. the first time, uh, to my recollection, when this kind of storming of the border uh, en masse has happened, and uh, it, of course, made many I analysts in Israel um, fearful that this is the sort of thing that Syria could orchestrate to create much further unrest. I'm not so sure that the Syrian government is behind this. In fact, we know that it's not behind this. This was a popular movement that was started on Facebook. It was started well before uh, the, it, Syria started uh, killing its own, its own citizens. Um, and so this is something that has been homegrown. These are the types of initiatives that have been taking place for a long period of time. Uh, Palestinians have long been marching towards their checkpoints and demanding that the checkpoints be opened up. Every year around the Nakba, there is a commemoration of, the, of uh, Israel's uh, display and ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. So this is not that, uh, that sort of, of, of something that is new. What is new about it is that it's coming at a, at a time when uh, there's no longer 
the quote-unquote stability in the Middle East that Israel was enjoying for many years, that uh, it's now beginning to realize that it cannot have this kind of stable uh, situation at the expense of millions of Palestinians and at the expense of hundreds of millions of Arabs around the world. So that's what the issue is when it comes to Israel and the fear that it's having, is that it doesn't know how to now deal with the Arab Spring and the, and the repercussions of the, of the Arab Spring. I think that's absolutely true, and it's exactly that kind of fear of instability, uh, which has many in Israel, in fact the Israeli Prime Minister arguing to the United States not to put pressure on now to restart the peace process because things are too uncertain uh, throughout the region. Uh, what do you say in response to that argument? This is exactly the wrong step to be taking, is to not do anything. I think the United States, and I'm hoping to hear today with uh, President Obama's speech, that he's going to come out with something that is different. He's going to finally uh, say something against the Israelis to make sure that they finally give rights to the millions of Palestinians that Israel continues to rule over. You know, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense in this day and age that we have a regime of apartheid that is, that is, in, this, that is in this region in which one uh, group of people are granted superior rights to another. I'm not, I'm not hopeful. I'm hopeful that uh, President Obama will come out with something, but I'm not optimistic because what, what the Obama administration seems to ignore is the, the role that Israel has played in the Arab Spring. It hasn't played a direct role in it, but uh, a lot of these protests are in effect caused by the fact that there has been, uh, that the rights of so many Arabs has come at the expense of, of uh, stability for Israel. Uh, of course, everyone is actually waiting to see what Obama actually says during the rest of today uh, in his time zone in the United States, of course. But uh, there is a fierce argument going on inside the American uh, system. That is, Dennis Ross, for example, a former advisor to President Clinton, is arguing, give Israel more time. Don't put Israel under pressure. Whereas, evidently, uh, the U.S. Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, is, is urging Obama to set out a detailed series of principles uh, on which the Middle East peace process could proceed. What do you think? Who will win that argument? Well, unfortunately, I think that it's going to be Dennis Ross in the end. I mean, Dennis Ross, I think we have to put, keep in mind that Dennis Ross was a paid lobbyist for the pro-Israel lobby uh, before, he, he, before he moved to the State Department. And, uh, and the pro-Israel lobby seems to have a lot of effect and impact in, in the United States. But I also don't necessarily agree with Hillary Clinton's approach. We already have principles. There are principles of international law, and it's merely a question of making sure that international law is upheld. And what I mean by that is, under international law, no country can take over the country of another nation. And this is precisely what Israel has done. It's taken over Palestine. It's brought in settlers illegally. It continues to bring in more and more settlers, even as we speak. And uh, at the same time, it's, it's, it's cleansed uh, the, the nation of, of its Palestinian inhabitants. This is what, what it did in 1948 and continues to do today by denying them the right to return. Now, all of these issues have been covered on, under international law. And it's really just a question of getting somebody to actually enforce the law. And here is where the problem lies, is that the United States doesn't want to be a legal enforcer. It wants to enforce law around the rest of the world, but when it comes to Israel, it's created an exception. And I think that if we want to make sense and move forward, the only thing that can be done is to really begin to get a collection of states to demand that Israel uphold international law and that it be sanctioned if it fails to uphold international law. It's a very simple equation, but it's one that seems to elude everybody simply because of the presence of the pro-Israel lobby and the fact that uh that nations around the world feel that they don't want to do anything because, uh, because they're afraid of actually stepping forward and doing something. Well, meanwhile, uh, the Israelis are arguing quite fiercely as well that the new Palestinian unity agreement between Fatah and Hamas uh, makes a peace deal pretty much impossible from their point of view. How can you counter that argument? I mean, they're saying a secular Fatah combined with a religious Hamas that doesn't believe in Israel's right to exist just means you can't have negotiations. It's very interesting. You know, um, just before the agreement was signed between uh, uh, Fatah and Hamas, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu was reported as saying that he couldn't reach a peace agreement with, uh, with Mahmoud Abbas because uh, Mahmoud Abbas was not in control of Gaza and he didn't represent the Palestinians in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. 
Now that there's an agreement, he's saying that he can't negotiate or can't reach an agreement with Mahmoud Abbas because, there's an, because Hamas is now on the scene. So it's, it, it's become very clear to people who are, who are watching that Israel doesn't want to reach an agreement. And this is why they continue to send in more settlers. Uh, this is why they continue to build more settlements illegally. For example, you know, if Israel really want, is really believing that there needs to be a peace agreement, why are they continuing to take more and more and more Palestinian territory if eventually that territory is going to go back to Palestine? In other words, they don't believe that that territory is going to go back to Palestine, and they're simply looking for one excuse after the, after the other. Now, on the issue of recognition, I think it's very important to, to recognize one very essential element, which is that Israel has never recognized Palestine's right to exist, never ever. None of the parties recognize Palestine's right to exist, and so I think it's erroneous just to be looking at Hamas and at Hamas's political stance, rather than to be looking at the region as a whole. And I think that what we need to do is look for reasons as to why to, to reach an agreement, rather than excuses so as to not reach an agreement. Okay, but can you explain for us how this this unity agreement between these two disparate groups, they have been disparate in the past, how it's going to work. I mean, for example, is Fatah going Absolutely. to be in a position to urge or to, to gain compromises from the much more hardline people in Hamas? Indeed, I think it, it, ha it will and it already has. Um, one thing that is important to keep in mind is that the government that's going to be formed is going to be a government that is neither a Hamas government nor a Fatah government. It's going to be comprised of uh, people who are what is termed technocrats in this region, uh, who, are not, who are not politically affiliated. It's going to be a group of people that everybody agrees should be the finance minister or the prime minister, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but on the bigger issue of compromises, what was interesting in when they signed the National National Unity Agreement was that the leader of Hamas actually very explicitly came out and said that all that they are seeking is statehood on the 1967 borders, meaning the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And they very explicitly said that. This was the first time that that, that individual has said that. But, uh, but there have been other statements in the past by Hamas leaders in which they've said that all that they seek is statehood on uh, the, the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip. And, uh, and that recognition will then follow. Once Israel recognizes Palestine, then there, there, there will be mutual recognition. But, so they've already come to a, a sense of concessions, but what we, what needs needs to happen is that this, gov this government needs to be supported. Um, it needs to be a government that the world recognizes. And I think we can't continue to cl close our eyes to the fact that Palestinians have diverse political views. And we can't continue to believe that we can choose uh, Palestinian leaders. Palestinians need to be able to choose their leaders for themselves. That's the essence of democracy. If by some miracle uh, substantive peace talks were able to be restarted, how would the unity agreement change the character of those talks and I suppose I'm asking here would they be much tougher from the Palestinian point of view because you now consider yourselves to be negotiating from a position of greater strength I'm not entirely certain about that. I think that uh, having been on the negotiating team and having seen what the negotiations were like, uh, the position was always a position that was grounded in international law. Hamas agreed to, agrees to that. Fatah agrees to that. Um, and so the only leverage, so to speak, that, that the Palestinians will now have uh, at the negotiating table, uh, if there ever are negotiations, and I don't think that there ever will be, is that it now comes to a, a, a position where Palestinians are speaking with one voice. Now, one voice in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip. Of course, the Palestinian refugees are excluded from these talks. But I think that that is, is something that was missing in the past, that in the past it was simply one political party that was negotiating at, to the detriment of all of the other political parties. But now we have the myriad of po political parties that are coming forward or that will come forward and, and articulate a very coherent position. We're nearly out of satellite time. I'll ask you one very quick last question. Are there any lessons from the Arab Spring uprisings that could be brought to bear on the Israel-Palestine conflict and on the negotiations? 
Most definitely. I think that uh, one thing that we need to realize is that uh, there can't the, the continued suppression, oppression of people will not be able to continue indefinitely. Eventually, people will rise up and uh, and they will demand their rights. This is something that we saw in Tunisia, we saw in Egypt, and we're now beginning to see in Libya and in Syria and around uh, the Middle East. So I think that these are very valuable lessons that Israel should learn. Rather than uh, trying to continue to oppress the Palestinians, they should come to a realization that we're not going anywhere and it's time to actually come to peace with us and with our presence rather than try to get rid of us. Dana Butu, we'll have to leave you there. We thank you very much for taking the time to come and talk to us tonight. My pleasure. Thank you.